All right, everyone, welcome to today's webinar on maintaining your ESD control plan. My name is Steve Guy. I'm Desco's Eastern Regional Sales Manager. And a side note to, uh, to see here is that I am also NAR INARDI certified as an ESD technician. Assisting me in this presentation today is Jeffrey Brake, Desco Brand Manager. As Jeffrey mentioned earlier in the chat, please ask your questions as we go on the panel to your right. There's a section for questions. You can quickly type your questions in there uh, as we go. We will be pausing right before the virtual demo to address any of your questions and uh, move from there. And if you have further questions after that, we can obviously uh, show our contact information at the end. To give you a quick overview, we'll be going over compliance verification, what it means, what, what the definition of compliance verification, We'll be providing some general maintenance of ESD control products in your EPA. And we'll be showing you proper testing equipment needed uh, when you're conducting your compliance verification checks. So what is compliance verification? First, the ESD Association is the organization that creates industry standards and we have the website there available to you. S20.20 .20 is this widely accepted standard document we use here at Desco and a lot of electronics manufacturers follow S20.20 .20 standards as well. And section 7.4 uh, defines a little bit more on what compliance verification is. And as we move forward in, in section 7.4 of S20.20, .20, compliance verification is designed to ensure that the organization is fulfilling the technical requirements of the ESD control program plan. It identifies the technical requirements to be verified, the measurement limits, and the frequency at which those verifications occur. Uh, it also documents the test methods and equipment used for making the measurements. And lastly, all verification records shall be established and maintained to provide evidence of conformity to the technical requirements. Now, not everything in ANSI S20.20 .20 is mandatory, but here are some technical requirements highlighted in the gray box to the right. Our first bullet talks about grounding and equipotential bonding systems, personnel grounding devices, such as your wrist straps, foot grounders, et cetera, your ESD protected areas and all the items uh, in the ESD protected area, your pack packaging and the marking. Your measurement limits are based on the reference standards in S20.20, .20, which again, you must follow, we must follow when you're doing your compliance checks. And the frequency depends on how often the product is used, how important it is to your ESD program or plan, and how sensitive the device is uh, in your EPA, ESD protected area. Now, uh, when performing compliance verification tests, it's important to ensure that you do the test as is for each of the elements in your program. You want to test your elements in a way they are normally in use, and if they fail, you can then troubleshoot. The test methods are detailed in TR53, which is another document, um, and it's also highlighted in S20.20 .20 in, in the table section of S20.20. .20. Now, uh, also, here are all the equipment you need to conduct your test, but for my demo today, I'll be using an electrostatic field meter, a resistance measurement apparatus, and uh, a resistance measurement electrode. And I'll, again, I'll be showing those products during the demo. Moving on to general maintenance examples for your smocks or ESD garments, you can use liquid detergents and non-ionic softeners. Uh, cool or warm water, tumble dry with low heat or hang dry, and the frequency after two to four week period uh, will be after each washing. Your test methods requires a resistance of your point to point, which is a sleep to sleep test, which again, I will demo during the demo section. And if you use the smock as your primary grounding method for personnel, then you want to test the smock like it is a wrist strap, right? Because that is a groundable static control system so it must the smock must be tested like a wrist strap okay and we can go over those limits during the demo for your work surfaces your typical maintenance requires daily cleaning uh, and preferably alcohol free solutions so uh, again it's it depends on your uh, on your application if you find that your mats are getting dirty much faster then you might want to increase the frequency at which you clean the mats right so in, down below your compliance verification frequency we highlight a four to six month schedule but again, it comes down to your application and what's going on within your ESD program. 
And if you're moving to a new area of setup uh, or just moving in general, moving buildings, you want to ensure that you do a compliance test on your work surfaces in, in the new area or the new section. The test methods for your work surfaces would be a resistance to ground test, which is what S20.20 .20 calls for. And again, I will demonstrate that in the demo. For your flooring, you want to sweep the dry floors. You want to sweep them, okay? So make sure the, the broom isn't wet or the floor isn't wet. So make sure it's a dry floor and you sweep it. Use a wet mop maintenance with ESD floor finish. And you also want to use ESD specified cleaners and maintenance products with ESD flooring and floor finishes. Compliance verification frequency, uh, I, we have two years, so we can do them daily, or you can do it on a one to three month schedule. And that depends on areas that are considered high traffic. So if you have more areas in your ESD program that are high traffic, you wanna clean it a little bit more than you would on a one to three month schedule. For your test method, the only test required uh, for your flooring, according to S20.20, .20, is a resistance to ground test. But we also have a point to point resistance test as a way of troubleshooting the floors if you begin to see failures on the floor, you can troubleshoot. And all that is, is really putting two weights versus one weight. And again, I'll show that during the demo. And for your ionizers, uh, you want to, your typical maintenance include vacuum away all the dust and particulate on the ionizer grate, a metal grate or fans. And you also want to ensure you're cleaning the emitters with alcohol. And this helps prevent or cut ero uh, corrosion of the metal uh, emitter pins. Now, the beauty about the Desco ionizers is that if you find that your emitter pin is not, uh, you know, you, you've cleaned it and it's still not emitting, then you can get replaceable emitter pins from Desco. So, again, we, we sell re replaceable um, pins. Now, the frequency will vary because, again, it depends on how often or how long you have the ionizers on on the work floor. So, if you leave them on all day, it might require more cleaning versus where uh, if you leave them on in certain periods of time, then less cleaning. The test methods for compliance verification checks for your ionizers involves it. The first thing you need to do is the balance test. And this is to ensure that your ionizer isn't blowing static electricity on your components. And if you find that your balance is great on the ionizer, then you can test the decay, okay? And all the decay is is, is testing how fast it takes away the charge off of your device. So we, in my demonstration, I'll be, I'll be showing you how uh, we do that, okay? Moving on here, other equipment used in your ESD protected area, typical maintenance, you want to make sure you use equipment vacuums, brushes, and cleaners designed for use in an ESD protected area. So the picture you're seeing here shows a pick and place machine, but if you have other equipment in your EPA, then you need to ensure that we, uh, you're using ESD cleaners like the vacuums and the ESD brushes. The frequency of these products will vary based on, uh, again, your ESD program or uh, the application. And your test method, you want to make sure you follow equipment manufacturer's guidelines. So for many and all of Desco's products, you can go on our website and there's a technical bulletin that gives you the guidelines for maintenance and, and testing and cleaning. And you also want to consider a process control monitoring system for your program. This slide here can be found in one of our blog section on, on our website. So if you go on our website, go to the blog section, you can find this uh, uh, information or this slide there in detail. And we're just quickly talking about how to disinfect uh, you know, your ESD products within your EPA. The first thing you wanna do is confer with your com company's health and safety department. You wanna make sure you're not sharing products such as wrist straps, smocks, gloves, or foot grounders. And you wanna use IPA with 70% solution should be used sparingly, okay? And that's important, sparingly. And you wanna follow that with restore surface and mat cleaner. Okay, and I have that solution here that I will uh, show to you guys. And you also want to ensure you're using non-bleach laundry sanitizers uh, when sanitizing your products. Now, an important thing to note here is that IPA and non-bleach sanitizers may degrade the performance and physical properties of the materials and are not recommended for long-term use. You want to make sure you're not using it over time, which is why we say you want to follow these. Uh, after using the IPA or the sanitizers, you want to follow through with restore surface uh, cleaner solutions that can boost the ESD properties of the product. Jeffrey, do we have any questions at this point? Uh, we do, Steve. Thank you to everybody who's uh, sent a few in here. Uh, one question is um, why, why, do we, why, why do we cite 
the ESD association and the S2020 document um, versus other possible things. Can you can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yes, uh, we we cite the ESD association and S2020 uh, and S20.20 document because uh, it is the most widely used documents for ESD control. Right, uh, ESD control for electronics manufacturers, right? Correct. So that's specifically what it's designed for. Um, so people who are handling ESD sensitive devices, um, right? right. Um, mm -hmm. it, and uh, somebody asked, um, where, where can you get S2020 and TR53? I believe both of those are free documents, is that right? That is correct. You can go on the ESDA Association's website, which is listed early in the, uh, in the presentation there, and you can get those documents on the site. Right. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, another question here about um, a little bit of clarification on, on smocks. They're, they're asking, how often do smocks need to be tested? Um, so I know, well, we, we talked about, we said two to four weeks, roughly. Right. Um, and that would be your your point to point, right? But that could be that could be longer depending on your your laundry cycles, right? That's correct. So yeah. you know there are times where electronics manufacturers will test twice a year, which is typical. But again, if your smock is used as the primary grounding method, uh, which means you're grounding the person who is wearing the smock, uh, then you want to test it like a wrist strap, which involves a daily test. Right. So that it, if you're using it as a uh, static, um, was a static control grounding system, uh, then it, then, then you're testing it like a wrist strap, right? That, that's what you're. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, let's. Um, I do have. There, there's a few other things that I'm chatting with people on here, um, back and forth. Let me clarify those questions, and we'll we'll answer those at the end uh, of the presentation after you do some of the the demonstrations. Does that yep. sound good? Perfect. Okay. So now we will transition to the live demo. So just give me a minute here to transition my cameras and we'll, we'll get it going. All right. So for the first demonstration, we're going to demo a compliance verification test on your garments or smocks, I should say. So to conduct your compliance verification test on the smocks, you want to first make sure that the smock, when you get it from the laundry service, is uh, that you put it on an insulated surface. So you want to isolate the smock from any dissipative work surfaces. After you do that, uh, we mentioned you do a sleeve to sleeve test. Uh, and there's different criteria we're testing to. So we mentioned the static control garment. And the resistance limit for that is less than one times 10 to the 11 ohms. And then if it's a groundable static control garment, your resistance test on that needs to be less than one times 10 to the ninth ohms. And if it's a groundable static control garment system, uh, then your uh, resistance needs to be less than 3.5 times 10 to the seventh ohm, which again is the same as the limit on the wrist straps. Okay, so if you're using it as a primary grounding mechanism for your employees or for personnel, you want to make sure it tests like the wrist strap. So I'm going to unfold our smock here and isolate it on my insulated surface. And we're going to use our surface resistance meter to conduct a sleeve to sleeve test on the resistance of this smock. All right. So I'm going to put out my spread the smock out on the on the table on the work area. You need two five pound weights as shown, and then you want to just use your surface resistance meter uh, to conduct the test here. So one black cord will go into this weight here, and the other, which is your red cord, will go into this weight, and then you, let's turn it on, right? And then we conduct our test. So right now I'm conducting the test, which is the sleeve to sleeve. I'm waiting for my test result, and right now my resistance is 1.82 times 10 to the 6 ohms as shown here, okay? Now, let's transition to our next product. Give me a minute to clean out my surface here, which is our work surface. So when you're testing the work surface, Ariel, the work surface uh, on the table, yeah, it could be just a table, it could be a table mat, you want to ensure that it's Test it as is. So you don't clean it as of yet. 
test it as is. And then if you see that you're getting failures or over the limit on your, on your resistance results, then you can clean it with a proper ESD solution, which is your restore. Uh, or if you wanted to sanitize, as we mentioned, you can use IPA with 70% solution, then follow through with, with a restore surface cleaner solution which will then boost the ESD properties of that mat, okay? So right now, this mat is grounded. I'm testing that it is in my production area. And what we're doing, according to S20.20, .20, we need to do a resistance to ground uh, test of the mat itself, okay? So what we need is one five-pound weight on the mat, as shown there. And then we're going to take the other lead uh, to third wire electrical, okay? So we're going to take the black lead to third wire and the red lead here and we have it on the table and we conduct the test. So S20.20 .20 calls for a resistance limit of less than one times 10 to the nine ohms on your test. So to conduct it, I just hit the test button one more time here on my uh, surface resistance meter and wait for our results. And right now I am getting 8.96 times 10 to the six ohms resistance to ground. So my mat here is well uh, in spec. Now, if I were to have some trouble, again, like I said, getting over the limit results, I would use my restore solution, as I showed you guys earlier, clean out my surface, then conduct the test. And oftentimes, if you still get uh, over the limit results, it could mean that your, your ground cord for your mat is loose or unplugged at the outlet, or the snap on the, on the work surface itself is loose. So you want to you you make sure you're checking all the cables and all the grounding mechanisms for your mat uh, as well when you're troubleshooting. Now the next test we're going to demonstrate here, I'm going to move this aside, I don't want it to be in the way, is your ionizer test. Okay, so for this demo specifically, as I mentioned, you want to make sure for compliance verification you test as is. So I have my benchtop ionizer here, which we will be testing. And the first test we need to do is our balance test. This is to ensure that the ionizer itself is in balance and, it, and the ionizer isn't blowing static electricity on your components, okay? And the test limit we're testing to here will be plus or minus 35 volts for your ionizers. Now, uh, for my test, I'm going to use my ionization test kit, which includes a field meter, uh, a charging plate, as well as the charging unit, as you see here. Uh, and the way you read the field meter, I'm going to bring it up a little closer once you power it on, uh, it's read in thousands hundreds and tens, okay? So if that was 1.50, it would be 1,500 volts uh, that I've been able to generate here. So to test the balance of your ionizer, all you need to do is turn your static field meter on with the charge plate only, and you need to put it in the airflow of the ionizer. Now, an important thing to note with ionizers, the further away it is from your work area or, what it, or your product, I should say, the, the more time it takes to remove the charge and when it's closer to your product, it's going to take less time to remove the charge on the product. So that I'm going to turn on my ionizer here. I'll move it a little bit closer so you see it, okay? But again, it's important to test as is. And right now my ionizer is on. So what you do is you turn on your field meter, as I mentioned, you zero it out so it's all zeros, and you put it in the airflow of the ionizer. If you get anything above plus or minus 35 volts, then you know uh, that your ionizer is out of balance. So to do that, zero it out. And when I put it in the airflow of the ionizer, I'm getting just four volts on there as shown here, okay? So that is very uh, um, uh, important to note there, okay? So I'm going to now test the decay of the ionizers, how fast it's removing the charge from the ionizer, uh, I mean, from the product. So remember, when it's closer, it's going to take less time. And when it's further out, it's going to take more time to remove the product. I mean, to remove the charge from the product. So what you need now is your charging unit. I'm going to induce a positive and a negative charge on this uh, static field meter with the charging plate. And I'm going to time how long it takes for the charge to uh, be removed from 1,000 volts to 100 volts. Okay, so I'll do it for the positive and then I'll do it for the negative. So to show you a demonstration of that, I'm just gonna bring the numbers a little bit closer. Right now I'm zeroed out, right? Close to zero, I should say. And I'm going to induce a positive charge on this. And you're going to notice it jumps to about 1400 volts. Let's do it, let's do it on camera, okay? Let's, let me bring it a little bit further. Okay, you notice the numbers just jump. 
So at a thousand volts, I'm going to put it in that airflow of the ionizer. And my goal is to see how fast it takes the charge down from a thousand volts to a hundred volts. And I'll do the same thing with a negative uh, charge. So right now I'm going to induce a positive uh, thousand volts. So about, there's about 1500 volts here, wait till a thousand. And then I'm gonna put it in my airflow, see how fast it goes to 100. Uh, to 100. And it, that happened in less than five seconds. I'll do it again, okay? Induce a positive charge. There's about 1500 volts, wait till a thousand, put in my airflow, and it brought it down to less than 100 in less than five seconds. And if I do the same thing with the negative, okay, that will tell me your, your decay, right? Wait till a thousand, put in my airflow, and again, in less than five seconds. Now, the time is user defined. So you get to define that as the uh, electronics manufacturer, how fast you want it to, to work. Most of the times in my experience, many electronics manufacturers pick less than 10 seconds in time, but you get to define that for, for your process. Now, another important thing to note for our ionizers is that you can, again, replace their emitter pins if they're too uh, damaged to be clean. Or you can, again, just unscrew your metal grate in the back of the unit, pull out the emitter pin, and you can clean it with an alcohol swab. So to show you, I have my overhead ionizer, which is very similar to this bench stop, by the way. So you can do the same exact thing for each of them. All you do is unscrew uh, the grate, metal grate, as shown here. And you can just use tweezers or something. And you pull out the emitter pin. And you can just clean it with an alcohol swab, which I have here, or cotton swab, whatever works for you. And then once it's clean, you can just put it right back in here. And again, the idea behind cleaning it with alcohol is to prevent, uh, to cut corrosion, right, of the emitter pin. But if it's too damaged, we have replaceable pin for that. Now I'm going to transition to our last demo, which is, again, compliance verification checks for your floor. So I'm going to take a minute here, switch my cameras, and uh, I'll get going on the floor test. <laughs> I switch my webcams. All right. So for compliance verification on your floors, S20.20 .20 calls for uh, a resistance to ground test of the floors. And the limit is it needs to be less than one times 10 to the nine ohms for your floors. What you need, again, is a surface resistance meter to check the resistance of your floor mats or your ESD floors. Uh, and for this case, uh, I have a mat here that's been cleaned. So for areas that are high traffic, you want to make sure that you test as is to make sure it's in spec or out of spec. And if you find that it's out of spec, you can use a ESD floor finish, ESD cleaners to clean the, uh, the floors and bring it back within spec. So to do your test, uh, here, all you need is that one weight on the floor for your resistance to ground test, and then the black lead goes to third wire electrical at the outlet. So for this demo here, I have my power strip plugged into my outlet back there, and the power strip is here, and I can just put this in my third wire electrical and conduct my test. Uh, and again, I'm just waiting for my test results. And right now, the resistance to ground of this floor mat itself is 9.53 times 10 to the fifth. I'm, again, I'm a little bit farther out, but that's the reading on the map. And as I mentioned, if you start to get uh, negative results or higher limits, uh, you can do a troubleshoot test, which requires just a point-to-point -point resistance test. And all it is is you're putting two weights on the floor uh, and you're getting the resistance of the floor mat itself. So that's... that's uh, all it is for your compliance verification test for your floor mats. Jeffrey, do we have any final questions at this point? Uh, yeah, can you go back to the other view? Sure. Uh, with you sitting down and, and get out the field meter. Yep. The, uh, somebody asked about zeroing it out. So can you just demonstrate that really quick? I'd like to, uh, how you would zero it. Sure. Uh, but while you're getting that set up, just there, there was a question about, um, I can address this, but um, when you're using floor finish about how to, the, the, the difference between sort of in, uh, improving the appearance of, of the area and 
getting good ESD control properties. And so Desco's floor finish or the stack guard floor finish that we sell is kind of designed for two things. And that is one, I mean, the primary thing is to create a grounding plane for operators that are standing on it with ESD shoes or ESD foot grounders. The secondary thing of it is to imp in improve the appearance. Generally speaking, our floor finish looks pretty good when it goes down just as is. But if you want to improve that, you can buff it. You can use our, our spray buff um, to create a, a better shine. And, and we, have, we have users who do that for areas where they might bring customers or they bring auditors um, and, and it's kind of a high profile area. But if it's just a general manufacturing area, typically our floor finish by itself um, with a wet mop um, every uh, two or three weeks is probably good enough. Daily sweeping, two or three weeks, uh, two or three weeks uh, uh, b between wet mops. Uh, and when you do a wet mop, you're adding a little bit of floor finish to the process uh, to improve the, the performance of the material. So if it was a high traffic area, you might you might look at doing a wet mop every one to two weeks. It, it just depends on that. So um, I hope, uh, hopefully that answers that. Um, can go ahead and show me how to uh, just show us how to, to zero that meter out, how you would normally. Got it, Steve. got it. So uh, what you do is again, you turn the power, I'm gonna come a little bit closer here. Okay, and right now you read the meter, it's zeroed out on its own. Right now you can read uh, the meter with, from thousands, hundreds and tens. Okay, that's how you read the results. And to zero it out, you can see right on the meter itself, uh, it plays the button in the middle that says range and then right underneath that it says zero so if you press and hold that on a grounded uh um, point in the grounded object it zeros the meter out as you see here okay and then now you can when you your when you point it at your hand there you're standing you're you're grounded right that is correct yeah so you're standing on the grounded surface with a you have a foot grounder on no I actually you, touch, not you could touch the mat though to ground yourself as well that's correct. So, okay. Um, and uh, somebody's asking about decay rate. We have a question about the decay rate. Uh, sure. I assume this is talking about ionizers. Um, can you review what the recommendation is for that? I'm sorry, I did. Uh, you might have covered it, but I was answering. I was uh, not. Been, I was typing questions back and forth. So, no can you review that again? No worries. Yes. So the decay. Uh, as user defined. So you as the ESD coordinator of your program or electronics manufacturer, you get to decide what to, that time is, okay? But the most common time uh, is less than 10 seconds. So you want it to work fast and you want it to remove the charges fast on your product. So a good range would be less than 10 seconds. Um, as you can see in my demo, when I demoed it, mine was working in less than five seconds. So, and again, the further the ionizer is from your product, the more time it takes to remove the charge versus when it's closer, uh, it's gonna move, remove the charge much faster. Gotcha, thanks. Um, also a question about how testing footwear, I'm sure, I think this is referring to shoes versus testing heel grounders. We didn't specifically cover that, but can you talk about test, uh, what, what the requirements are for compliance verification for shoes versus foot grounders so uh for shoes and foot grounders you you need to test uh less than one times 10 to the ninth ohms resistance to the ground so the operator in combination with your floors and i think we covered this in our previous webinar you want to make sure that the entire flooring system uh, is within spec now you can test the components of that but to test the full resistance of the person in combination with the floors your resistance limit needs to be less than one point one times 10 to the ninth ohms resistance to ground. Gotcha. I mean, I, did you want me to, I can demonstrate as well, but uh, all of you really no, need to, okay. that, That's okay, that's okay. Oh, right. um, let's, let's, let's try to take this one. This one's a little bit, somebody's asking about using the walking test. Um, I know you're, we're somewhat familiar with that. And, can you explain when you would when you would use the walking test versus using your point to point resistance? You got it. So the walking test is designed for uh, product qualifications, right? So uh, as according to STM 97.2 and 97.1, uh, it defines it shows you the process, the pattern, right? And which we demoed in our previous webinar. 
but you would you would use your your walking test for product qualification to qualify the product into your EPA. And your point-to-point -point test would be for compliance verification tests, uh, such as this, which I just showed you uh, in this demo. Gotcha. Yeah, so there is a difference between qual product qualification testing and compliance verification testing, right? Correct. That's, that's kind of the important thing, I think. Um, there are situations where you would end up doing the walking test um, as a so if you were going to qualify a new foot grounder, let's say that yep. you hadn't previously used in your facility, um, then you would you you would want to do the walking test in your facility with the new foot grounder you were looking to qualify. Correct. And once you do it once, right? Product qualification is done once. Once you qualify the product, everything else after that would be compliance verification. Right. That the com compliance verification is sort of your day-to-day -day type of of measurements that you're you're making, right? Correct. Uh, somebody noticed on the the field meter that it was decaying even without um, the in the presence of the ionizer. Um, I'm guessing. Well, one, it will decay slightly. Um, eventually, all charges return to zero uh, yeah. or fine balance, but um, it's way too slow for for controlling charges in an in an APA. Um, so that's why we have ionization. I you probably did you have the ionizer on the whole time? Yeah, I think that could be the case because it yeah it, yeah hit the airflow of the ionizer when I was. So you'll get some residual ions in the air, uh, even out of the direct airflow that that is probably pushing that along. Um, right. So. That's probably what was going on there, but but there but I mean eventually all charges will dissipate. It just takes a really long time, and for ESD control we're talking about nanoseconds. So that's why you have an ionizer when you're when you're bringing uh, either a uh, an insulator or a or a charge uh, or an isolated conductor into the work area. So right. we need a much faster time. Um, I think that's that pretty much covers all the questions uh, that we can kind of do here. There are some questions that I will follow up with, with people in, a, in an email, I think, uh, or we can give them a call. So I, I appreciate it, Steve. Thanks for everything today. Um, you want to give out your, your contact information in case somebody wants to contact you directly? Can you bring up your screen? Sure. All right, so uh, we addressed the, we did our demos uh, and here's my contact information, everyone. Uh, so you can contact me directly at my phone number or my email if you have additional questions as Jeffrey said, and I'll be more than happy to address those uh, questions and provide support. And again, thank you for your time in attending our first webinar for this year, 2021, and we're excited to see you next month. Thanks.